Now let's look at how to detect a person who is lying. There are six and a half thousand languages in the world. It's scary and terrifying when you're in the country and you can't speak the language, not even read the signs. But there is a language we all understand. The language of the body. You can spot a bad day when two people are talking. You can read confidence, shyness, love. Now let's look at how you could be able to detect someone's feelings or someone's lie. The first is an eye contact. They generally say I are the window to the soul. Everyone who stares at you is it just a pink tongue. So when you're looking at someone and fixing them, it shows confidence, interest, honesty. These are great factors that should be considered in giving a job interview. But when someone is looking at the floor, then they won't be hired. But then you should differentiate strong eye contact to a hard stare. But this rule is not a general rule. In Eastern Europe, no more for people staring at you in public places. Without being creepy or aggressive, as people assume in UK or US. Second factor is the male legs. The legs help us to move from point A to point B. Man spreading legs is a dominant person. The person who is in charge. He wants to show who's the boss. And he wakes up in the feeling of you the man. In most European countries in Asia, a left leg crossed over their right and toes pointing down would probably indicate a closed nature in the US. But if right leg crossed over the left and ankle resting over the knee, it's a confident and argumentative. Let's now look at female legs. The postures of female legs generally are influenced by clothing. Leg spreading is mostly, mostly looked at as impolite in many cultures. Most of the times the legs are put together. But when one crossed foot wraps around the back of the other, And this is called a nanka lock. This is a sign of repression or fear for both male and female.
Research has proven that 88% of people lock ankle on a dental chair. But when both legs are together parallel, this is a sign of taking control. Another sign is playing with hair. While taking hair away from your face, this shows flirtation on openness, happy and joyful. But pulling your hair back shows awkwardness or nervousness. But when someone is passing a finger in their hair, it is a sign of relaxation. But be careful, when you hold your hair with one hand and by another you toil the hair, then this is a sign of nervous signal. The other sign is drumming fingers. Some other signs might, might not be clear and visible, but drumming fingers is loud and visible. This is a sign of impatience, frustration across the room. Sometimes you might not even realize you're doing it. But some other dominant people show that they are not happy by drumming their fingers. Let's now look at arms and hands. This is a very natural thing that we learn from childhood. When arms are crossed, kids always look at it as being in big trouble. But it must also depend. Someone might just feel cold and cross their arms. But when arms are crossed behind your head, this is a sign of shyness, fearlessness anger, calm, or simply you've just been arrested by police. The other sign is rubbing palms. Rubbing palm is just a sign of expecting a good outcome. But when you're holding your palm open, facing up, this is a sign of trustworthy. Lifting up your hands and your arms in the air. There is another sign where you point your body. The chest is a sign of big arrow. Where you point it is where your interest lies. Not pointing your chest to the other person means you're not interested or you disagree. When your chest is, fa is facing down while kneeling, it means you guarded. Sometimes your face might turn to who is talking, but just turn to who they want to listen to. 
So when the chest is facing you, it means they are more likely wanting to listen you to who they are looking at. The other sign is shaking hands. Shaking head, hand beneath and two-handed shake means sincerity, closeness. But trapping their hands shows a sign of dominance with the other person's hand in between your both hands. But when you're shaking a hand of someone holding a sho their shoulder, it also shows closeness. But politicians are faking it these days. So lying is a skill that takes practice. And sometimes like lack of eye contact is a sign of dishonesty. When someone's eye is facing right, it means they're using their imagination, but not their memory. So you get to know that someone is flirting by looking at what they're doing. If you accept it in your float, then you just go out. But if you're not, the person will just say thank you and goodbye. So how do you get to know that someone is lying to you? You get to know about it when someone is not looking at you. When they bring the hand to mouth or jar in grooming gest gestures like fixing hair or when someone is fighting in the chair or setting the clothes and sometimes they can be swallowing deeply sometimes the heartbeat increases the legs and hands fidget as if they want to run away When you lie, you keep it as simple as possible, without any more details. But generally, when you're talking to someone, people go about two senses, what they hear and what they see. Generally, people don't add how it smells. Or special relationships or the interaction with other people they keep it at a shallow level that's how you get to know that someone is lying to you it's like cutting an onion half Somebody could lie about where they were on that day and maybe who they were with. But if you ask what they were doing at that time, what were they watching on TV or who won the football game or who scored the last goal that would tell you 
if they are lying or not if they tell you different versions as they told you earlier someone can be very calm but when the person is also very extremely calm means they are trying to hide some things in the verbal you can get to notify the kind of words that can be used to prove that someone is lying there are words like such almost like kind of these words show that the teller isn't confident for example someone tells you I started to go to work that means they didn't finish the task they were supposed to nonverbal movements are like changes in the body movement For example, if someone was sitting there straight and answering you, you attentively, he was so direct, then abruptly he becomes fugitive. Strange movements, legs shaking, arms moving. When this happens when they are under stress of lying or sometimes they could increase or decrease the volume generally when a person is lying they tend to increase their voices words like I think too that I can say is an example of words that you were not proud to say but you need to bring it up in courage sometimes people try to bring in three or four sentences to emphasize, to emphasize that what they're saying is true When you're telling facts, you simply state them. When you're telling a lie, you find a way to convince the people that you're, tr you're telling the truth. Now let's look at the tips that are always needed or the basic first aid training tips and procedures for any emergency. Injuries are practically inevitable in emergency situations. There's a chance you get hurt but whatever causing the emergency. For example, you could get burned in the fire. Or you could get struck by toppling debris during an earthquake. But injuries are also sustained during the panic that ensures in an emergency. In the rush to get away from danger, you could sprain your ankle and suffer an open wound. Here are 10 first aid must know. that you can use to treat a broad array of injury it is important that you commit these 10 gold rules to memory even if you're not injured you might encounter someone 
who is and who needs treatment. First, remember the three P's. Check the scene for danger before you provide help too. Three, to treat cuts and scrapes, apply gentle pressure disinfectant and bandages. Four, to treat sprains, apply ice and compression at intervals and keep the limb elevated. Five, to treat heat exhaustion, use cool fluids, cool cloths and shade. To treat hypothermia, use warm foods and warm covering. To treat burns, determine the burn type and severity. Cover the wound with loose, with a loose cloth to prevent infection. Use an EpiPen to treat allergic reactions. To treat fractures, keep the fractured area stable and immobilized. Then apply a cold pack. Ten. Perform CPR if an injured person stops breathing. Always attempt to seek professional medical help to injured persons. First responders are not always readily available during emergency situations. And if that's the case, so do your best to provide what treatment you can until help arrives. But never forget, serious injuries always require more advanced treatment. And you should do your best to get the injured person to professional caregivers. Nonetheless, these simple first aid procedures can go a long way in helping someone who is injured. And all you need to do is use a few material in your survival kit and apply them in the right manner. Now, let's look at the three P's. The three P's are the primarily goals of first aid. They are preserve life, prevent further injury, promote recovery. These goals might seem overly simple. but they are simple on purpose. When someone is injured, it's all too easy to panic and forget what you need to do to provide assistance. The three P's remind you of the very basics. Do what you can to save the person's life. Do what you can to keep them from sustaining further injuries. Do what you can to help them heal. 
second check the scene for danger before you provide help in an injured person it's important that you check the scene for danger you don't want to get yourself injured too this isn't a cowardly precaution the fact of the matter is this if you get injured you won't be able to help someone else who's injured so before you rush to help someone take a moment to analyze the area and spot anything that could injure you for example there might be a terrible storm outdoors and you spot someone outside who's injured and who can't move it to a shelter before you go running outside to help them look for hazards are strong winds hurling debris are there any trees or structures that look as if they're about to fall are they droned power lines is there flood water once you've assessed three these dangers you can better strategize how to reach and rescue the injured person three treating cuts and scraps blood is a vital component of our bodies when someone is bleeding you want to prevent as much blood from leaving their body as possible try and find a clean cloth or bandage then apply gently pressure for 20 to 30 minutes clean the wound by gently running clean water over it avoid using soap or an open wound I've apply antibiotic to the wound cover the wound with a bandage if someone has nose bleed have the person lean forward press a cloth against the nostrils until the blood flow stops the body is usually very quick and patching up small cuts and scraps but deeper wounds may require medical attention so with deep wounds apply pressure don't apply ointments cover the area with loose loose cloth to prevent contaminants from infecting the wounds seek medical attention as soon as possible for treating sprains sprains are usually an an alarming injury 
and most of the time they will heal in their, on their own. But there are steps you can take to ease the swelling. Swelling is caused by blood flow to an injured area. You can reduce swelling by applying ice. Ice restricts the blood vessels, which reduces blood flow. Keep the injured limb elevated. Apply ice to the injured area. Don't apply ice directly to the skin. Wrap it in the cloth or put ice in a plastic bag. Keep the injured area compressed. Put it in a brace or tightly wrap it. Don't wrap it so tight that it could cut off circulation. Ice for a while, then compress. Repeat at intervals. Make sure the injured person avoids putting weight on the injured limb. 5. Treating heat exhaustion. Heat exhaustion occurs due to prolonged exposure to high temperatures. Especially when a person is doing strenuous activities or hasn't had enough water. Symptoms of heat exhaustion include cool, moist skin, heavy sweating, dizziness, weak pulse, muscle cramps, nausea, headaches. To treat someone with heat exhaustion, get the person to a shaded area that's out of the sun. If there are no shaded areas available, keep the person covered by any available material that can block sunlight. Give the person water and keep them hydrated. Place a cool cloth on their forehead to lower the body temperature. Treating hypothermia 6. Hypothermia is caused by prolonged exposure to cold temperatures. It begins to occur when your body temperature drops below 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Symptoms of hypothermia include shivering, Slurred speech or mumbling, weak pulse, weak coordination, confusion, red cold skin, loss of consciousness. To treat hypothermia, be gentle with the afflicted person. Don't rub their body and don't move their body into jarring 
of the way. This could trigger cardiac arrest. Move the person out of the cold and remove any wet clothing. Cover the person with blankets and use heat packs. Don't apply heat directly to the skin because this could cause major skin damage. Give the person warm fluids. If you set the person on the ground, be aware that the ground may also be a cold source. Place warm materials on the ground that the person is going to lay on. 7. Treating burns. Before you apply treatment to burns, you need to identify the burns type and the severity of the burn. There are four kinds of burns. The first degree burn. Only the outer layers of the skin are burnt. The skin is red and swollen and looks similar to a sunburn. The second degree burn Some of the inner layer of skin is burnt. Look for blistering skin and swelling. This is usually a very painful type of burn. Third type, third degree burn. All of the inner layer of skin is burnt. The wound has whitish or blackened color. Some third degree burns are so deep. There might not be any pain because the never ending are destroyed. Fourth degree burn. A burn that has penetrated all tissues up to the tendon and bones. Additionally, there are two kinds of burn severity, a minor burn and a major burn. A minor burn, first degree burns and mild second degree burns. The major burn, the moderate second degree burn to fourth degree burns. Minor burns don't usually need extensive treatment, but you could run cool water over the afflicted area. Avoid icy or very cold water. Do not break any blisters. Apply moisturized over the area like aloe vera. Keep the burned person out of sunlight. Have the burned person take ibrofen or some other pain relief. Major burns are very serious injuries that require medical assistance. To help someone who has suffered from a major burn, do not apply ointments. Cover wound with loose materials to prevent contaminants from infecting it. Eight. Allergic inf infection. 
Allergic infections occur when your body is hypersensitive to a foreign substance. B stings certain foods or drug ingredients that can allerg aller can cause allergic reactions. Anaphylaxis is a life threatening al allergic reaction that can be caused by all of these mentioned allergens. The best way to treat an allergic reaction is to use an EpiPen. EpiPen or epinephrine auto injector is a small and ergonomic needle that's used to inject epinephrine adrenaline into someone suffering greatly from an allergic reaction the epinephrine usually subdues the effects of allergic reaction If someone is suffering from an allergic reaction, keep the person calm. Ask if they use an EpiPen and have one with them. Have the person lie on their back. Keep their feet elevated 12 inches. Make sure the person's clothing is loose so they are able to breathe. Avoid giving them food, drink or medicine. If appropriate, use a nappy pin. Learn how to inject an nappy pin in someone having a reaction. Wait 5 to 10 minutes after using an EpiPen. If the allergic reaction isn't subdued, a second dose may be required. Nine, treating fractures. Sometimes it's very easy to tell if someone has suffered a fractured bone, but sometimes it's not. If you suspect someone of having a fracture, do not try to straighten a fractured limb. Use a splint or padding to stabilize the area and keep it from moving. Apply a cold pack to the area. Don't apply directly to the skin. Wrap it in a cloth or put it in a plastic bag. Keep the area elevated if possible. Give the person an anti-inflammatory drug like buprofen. 10. Perform CPR. CPR stands for cardiopulmonary resuscitation. CPR is used to restore breathing and blood circulation to an unresponsive person. CPR is an incredibly important procedure that can save lives. But learning CPR is an intensive procedure that requires some training which is usually in the form of a day-long class. Prepare yourself for the right gear. 
the method listed above are not very difficult to do and they don't require medical training but can, they can save someone's life or prevent an injured person from sustaining serious injuries or infections. Make sure that your stash of surviving gear includes a first aid kit and be sure to refill your first aid kit every year as it supplies or expires. The essential first aid kit should include antibacterial wipes, painkillers, gauze pads, sunscreen, medical gloves, medical instrument kit, sling, burn gel, antibiotic ointment, antiseptic wipes, first aid instructions, and tourniquet. So, as long as you have a functioning survival mm -hmm. kit, you'll be prepared to give treatment to yourself or others when an emergency situation causes injury. Now, let's look at five ways to find north without a compass. So, you've gone on a walkabout and got quite seriously lost. You have a map, but you don't even have a compass, and the phone has died. You look on the map and see that in the northeast of the national park there is a village. Where can you find food and shelter? The trouble is, there is no landmarks on the horizon to help you work out your position on the map and which way you are facing. Fear not. Below are five ways to find north and get you out of this life and death situation. Look to the stars. If it's night time, you want to look to the stars for guidance. If you can locate North Star, then you will know where North is, and consequently, East, South, West too. However, the North Star, also known as Polaris, is not always so easy to find, though it's fairly bright. It is certainly not the brightest star that accolade goes to Sirius, after the Sun obviously. If you're struggling to locate it, then you want to look for a plough known as a Big Dipper in the US and find the two stars at the blade end of it. Draw an imaginary line through these two stars and follow the line upwards where you reach the North Star. However, this only works in the Northern Hemisphere. If you're in the Southern Hemisphere, things get a little trickier as you can see the North Star there. You are in the Southern Hemisphere. 
Instead, locate the four bright stars that make up the Southern Cross and draw an imaginary line that goes through the two stars that make up the long axis of the cross and carries on five times the length of this axis and you will be looking in the direction of the South Pole. If it's still night and you can't find a North Star, there is another way. Find two sticks and lie down. Push one stick into the ground so it's at eye level. Take a second. Slightly taller stick and push it into the ground behind the first one until they line up with a bright star from your position. Watch for five to ten minutes. If the star moves left, you're facing north. Right then, south and up and down, east and west, respectively. Shadow. If it's daytime, you have a few options. The first is to take advantage of shadow. Put a stick in the ground and mark with a stone where the end of the shadow falls. Then wait for half an hour or so. The shadow will have moved and got shorter or longer. Place another, another stone at the end of this shadow. If you stand at a perpendicular angle to the stake, you will be facing north. Not. If you're in the southern hemisphere, then it will be the reverse as the sun tracks through the east to west in the northern hemisphere. Analog watch. If you're wearing an analog watch, one with hands on it as opposed to digits, hold it horizontally in the palm of the arm. Hold it horizontal in the palm of your hand and point the hour hand to the sun. Say it is two o'clock. Draw an imaginary line between the hour hand and twelve o'clock to create the north-south line. You know the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. So this will tell you which way is north and which way is south. If you're in the southern hemisphere, then it will be the other way around. Note, if your watch is set for daylight, saving time, then wind it back an hour.
months. If it's overcast, then took look to nature, namely moss, to find north. Moss can only thrive in damp conditions. Damp conditions often, though not exclusively, occur in shadowy areas. In northern hemisphere countries such as the UK, the sun moves east to west, but it always tracks this path in the south. In some, north facing gets the least amount of sun, consequently will be the dampest area. To make sure you're not being misled, look for moss or vertical structures such as trees and other places where water doesn't naturally collect. Now let's look at how to handle GPS failure. The navigation app we carry around in our smartphones may have made getting lost in foreign land and distant memory. But our dependency on the global positioning system or GPS in short runs far deeper than we realize. GPS satellites owned by the United States government carry on board the atomic clocks that maintain this time standard followed by the world. Coordinated Universal Time UTC and accurate time, time stamps are crucial for the smooth functioning of everything from electric power, grids to higher speed financial transactions where each millisecond translates into millions. Even the internet service you're using to access different pages relies on precise GPS timestamps to root data, as do all digital communication systems. So if the GPS if the GPS were to fail the ramifications would not be limited to airborne fights and the ships at sea finding themselves isolated from the rest of the world. Armies would lose all control over drones monitoring natural disasters or surveillating terrorist outfits. Weather forecasts would be totally off and digital televisions and radio will not be able to continue transmission. Essentially, a total collapse of GPS could wreak havoc on a large number of systems intrinsic to the smooth functioning of our lives. Last time when GPS failed, in January 2016, when the US Air Force decommissioned the GPS satellite, an incorrect timestamp was uploaded to other functioning satellites. Their clocks recorded a, a discrepancy of 13 microseconds or 13 millionth of a second. The error may seem minuscule in writing, but the ensuing chaos lasted for over 12 hours across the world. The 
Reports from several parts of the United States and Canada said police, fire, and radio equipment was not functioning and anomalies were detected in power grids. What's ever more mind-blowing is that the slip resulted in BBC Digital Radio going capered for the whole days. At least the error was an international, right? Right. But today the problem of international the problem of intentional GPS disruption is becoming more and more widespread. In 2009, GPS interference was detected around Newark Airport, compromising the air traffic controller's ability to receive precise location information about airplanes. An investigation revealed that the disruption was caused by a truck driver who was using an illegal GPS jamming device. So his employer couldn't track his where about. A similar device used at a wrong place could affect maritime navigation as well. And let's not forget nature. In 1859, the world witnessed a solar storm so strong that if it were to take place today, it would knock out all satellites orbiting our planet. Known as the Corrington event. After the name of the astronomer who discovered it, this superstorm was powerful enough to cause severe geomagnetic disturbance on Earth and send telegraph system into a tizzy. NASA gave a report. Just before dawn, skies all over planet Earth erupted in red, green, and purple auroras so brilliant that newspapers could be read as easily as in daylight. Indeed, stunning, auroras pulsated even at near tropical latitude over Cuba, the Bahamas, Jamaica, El Salvador, and Hawaii. So, we are doomed by our deep-rooted dependency on GPS, not necessarily. The way out GPS alternatives. For starters, several nations have built their own satellite navigation system to rival the US owned GPS. Russia's GLONASS, China, China's Beidou, Navigation system, si satellite system, and the European Union Galileo operate at a global level. While India and Japan have developed regional nav navigation and augmentation systems, atomic clock failure. However, is a problem that has plagued these systems too. Last year, nine clocks around 18 Galileo satellite in orbit stopped working without warning. India, meanwhile, has reported the failure of seven on of the 21 clocks. It has in its constellation of navigation satellites. And let's not forget that the signals from this satellite can be jammed too, which highlights the need for no satellite-based alternatives. 
for years, the U.S. Coast Guard used a land-based radio navigation system called Lorraine C. The system became obsolete once GPS was widely adapted. But there is no reason why an upgraded version of the same cannot serve as a promising backup. South Korea is reportedly already developing such a system and the US wants to follow suit. Another option could be ground-based fiber optic cables. In a recent experiment, the US Department of Commerce National Institute of Standard and Technology patterned with the Naval Observatory to test signal transmissions between two federal time scales. The results show that the official world time scale UTC could be transferred with a stability of less than a hundred nanoseconds so long as the connection was not broken. Well, one thing is for sure. Without navigation satellites, the world as we know, it will look like a very different place. And while the utter and complete failure of GPS may only be a dystopian scenario, it never hurts to have a plan B in place. Thank you for listening. My name, Kibera Freddy.